What is it about the weather? I'm your host, Mark Jelinek, and I want to welcome you back to our latest episode. I hope since we last talked a couple weeks ago that you've had some good, exciting, and interesting weather. I know many parts of the globe have been dealing with some extreme weather events. Southeast Asia, from India over through Indonesia, has been dealing with a pronounced and prolonged heat wave. Portions of Australia have been dealing with some very strong autumn storms. The central and eastern portion of the U.S. dealt with a uh, multi-day severe weather outbreak that included multiple tornadoes and strong hailstorm events. And most recently, a portion of Canada has been dealing with a major wildfire outbreak. And I know that's not specifically a weather event, but it's believed that the anomalously warm weather that they've been receiving since the beginning of the year and even most recently 90 degree Fahrenheit weather in this past week has been a strong contributing factor to how bad it has been. So again, hope you haven't been dealing with anything quite that bad. Um, But as always, I hope there's been something to pique your interest in the weather. In this week's episode, we're going to be exploring the idea or the connection between language and weather. Now, I know some of you may have some fer- pretty creative language that you like to, to use when you get a weather forecast that doesn't pan out the way you want to. And, you know, to put a little humor in it from that standpoint, as many of you know, I, I lived in Chile for many years. And um, we knew some folks that, uh, well, they had a kid that couldn't quite get the word for meteorologist out of their mouth. Now, the, I, I'm going to butcher it as well. It's meteorologo. And it's not, as you can tell even with my butchering, it's not a, a word that just rolls off your tongue. And their kid used to uh, say, mentiroso, and it's a valid word in Spanish. But the interesting thing is the word is liar. So uh, they weren't correcting their kid. They actually found great humor in that. So you can uh, understand and appreciate the fact, as I do this podcast in English, that across languages that people have creative words for uh, their meteorologists sometimes. But let's let's get into, uh, I guess, what prompted this. So recently, I heard someone say, well, don't you know, the Inuit have over a thousand words for snow. Now, that was the greatest number I had ever heard attached to uh, the great snow legend. And I've always wondered if it's true. I mean, to me, it'd be kind of cool, right, if, if someone had that many words for snow. That, that sounds like a lot of different types of snow and interesting aspects of snow. Um, but apparently all this was born out of the concept of uh, an introductory text that was um, provided by a gentleman named Franz Boas in introducing... Uh, and what it wasn't actually even, you know, he was writing an introductory sec- section to a book about um, the called the influence of environment on language, and within that document, and I'll put a, a link to it. There's actually a, a, a like a microfilmed copy available on the internet. He introduces the concept of four words that are all used to relate the concept of snow. And the point being, and and when you start to to really dig into this, you start to realize that really what what was going on here is the the words were as much a descriptor as they were suggesting um, the noun snow within their context. Now, in English, we're very used to taking a word, a noun, and putting descriptors around it, like maybe that's wet snow or dry snow, or fluffy snow, or uh, big flake snow, or snowman snow, uh, whatever it might be. But but snow is still a singular word, and all these adjectives are are describing, you know, some aspect of snow. Well, it seems that the Inuit and and many Eskimo languages um, have a, a particular aspect of them that that's not being considered in all this and a gentleman um, by the name of uh, Larry Kaplan at the Alaska Native Language Center 
has wrote a nice summary piece actually going back through this whole legend and two people, two uh, um, researchers that looked into the concept, a um, both case studies, one um, by an anthropologist uh, named Laura Martin and a second by a linguist named Jeffrey Pullum. Um, and in even his, it, it kind of gives the, the rest of the story away, so I'm not going to give the titles. But, but they investigated, and, and what they really explore and bring to the forefront is the reason that they have this many words, and in, in concept maybe they do, is the languages, um, particularly Inuit and many of the Eskimo languages, are built on the concept of suffixation. So um, this is an example. So imagine that the uh, word for snow was wa, and the, the word for falling was la. So it would be wala, would be falling snow. And maybe the word for ground was go. So wago would be snow on the ground. So as you can imagine, however you wanted to describe snow, instead of it being individual words, you attach those suffixes as they are to the word the word for snow itself so they become part of the noun itself in describing it so he heard four but there were many more so but let's be realistic in that so conceptually there's an endless supply but what's probably even more interesting in this is there there have been some people that have taken it and and you know investigate a little further and so I came across one, and it was interesting. It was an exchange, and this this list is on the internet again, and it, it uh, um, starts out seeming very logical. So it says the Eskimos hundred words for snow, and it's written by a, a gentleman named Phil James. I have no idea if this person's even real, and it starts going through this list. So, for instance, pla is the word that they're saying is snow, and so tla pa is powder snow. And then, you know, they do have a couple, then um, they go, he starts building this whole list. And you can see, like, uh, that, so Tlee might be a slightly different variation, or Tlee Yell has been snow that has been marked by wolves. So you can see where this is going real quickly. And then they have Wa Ter is melted snow. So, Obviously, the whole list is a hoax, but I'll put the I'll put a link in this one because it's, it is actually really, really a, a funny read through. But what was probably even more interesting and disturbing and me being a little bit of a of a Star Trek fan myself is when I when I saw Tlapa, I immediately thought that this was probably the, written in Klingon. Um, so now I'm going to have to go cross check how many of these words are actually Klingon words that he took and, and just used it to, uh, to make this humorous list. But again, the, the concept being that is there a thousand words for snow? Yeah, actually, there might be. But what was trying to be originally uh, presented by Franz Boas is, is just it wasn't true. There, there's not this like there's a thousand different types of snow per se, which is what the premise was and what it's grown to over time. So hoax, yes, but could you say that it's actually true if you wanted to be? Yeah. Um, I don't know that you get to a thousand. That might be take a little bit of uh, beyond normal creativity. But certainly um, they take the, the base word snow originally, um, and introduced many describing factors to it um, that you might not see in places that don't experience a lot of snow or for people that aren't used to a lot of snow. But as I've said, I mean, even in, in limited times that people see snow, I, you know, a lot of people know the difference between a wet snow and a dry snow or fluffy snow. So, um, again, links, links in the show notes. So uh, it, it's an interesting thing to think about where these legends come from and and sometimes there is some reality in what they're based from even if the basis for the myth uh, was an inaccurate research statement which it turns out that this was uh, with the point that he was trying to make in his original research so that's looking at whether to describe snow but when I was investigating this probably the more interesting part was that it appears that the climate and weather of different regions across the globe, globe, excuse me there, actually influence the way languages have developed over time. 
So specifically, a couple of, of pieces of research I came across. So the first one had to do uh, with humidity. So it took different, it, it looked at the different language or sub-languages all across the globe. Um, and it's really neat this day and age where we have big data. And someday we'll, we'll talk about big data and, and, and weather's influence on it and how it's now uh, changing the way that we'll think about weather forecasts going forward. But we, we can do all these comparative understandings that we weren't able to do in the past as easily. But if you look at languages that have more complex phonemic tones, um, and, uh, you know, specifically, you know, if, if you're thinking about the regions where that comes into play the most, uh, again, we get into Southeast Asia, you, know, you think about um, just even modern day languages like Chinese and Vietnamese, as well as portions of Africa um, in the more jungle-oriented portions of Africa or, you know, the tropical areas of Africa, again, where, where high humidity, and they have a very different sound to them than what you think of uh, when you think of, you know, the uh, Romantic languages or even, you know, languages, uh, again, even getting into the Inuit or the Eskimo languages, etc., it's a very it's a very different sound structure to it and apparently the humidity and its influence on the vocal cords and you can think about this when when you think about when you're dehydrated and how hard it is to say certain things or how different your voice sounds when you've got a dry or scratchy voice versus when it's well moisturized and and how how different even your normal voice sounds. It's, it's logical to understand how that might be the case. So these tones um, in the structure of the language were the ability to add them to the language was really constrained by or expanded by how much humidity there was in the region. And that might dictate whether a language made it out of a certain region or why people may be in... Uh, the U.S., for instance, might have trouble learning some Chinese dialects or Southeastern Asian dialects because they have come from regions or even still live in regions where it's hard to make the sounds specifically because they didn't grow up doing that in, a, in an area where their the physiology of their body actually let them do that. On the flip side of that, the other thing, and this isn't so much the weather as it is your climate, but you know we're going to kind of use them interchangeably here. So ones that lived in high altitudes where the climate was under less pressure, so less atmospheric pressure, um, and traditionally maybe a little bit, again, we get into a drier, so higher altitude, a little bit colder. And that also has changed um, in the type of languages that use ejective phonemes, okay? So again, these have to do more with um, introducing of kind of sounds that introduce words or stops. So you, you hear them in some places where it's like a, a tick or a click or a kind of sound or something, more of a sound than a word itself. So not so much the a, a vocabulary as it's used as maybe you instead of saying period you might use a sound to describe the concept of period or a comma or something else and those are harder to do at low altitudes because again the structure the physiology of the human body and this time we're not talking vocal cords because we're using an actual the the muscular skeletal nature of the human body to create these sounds so languages, again, all across the globe have developed based on the weather and climate where people live. And that's kind of interesting when you think about, you know, I, I, like I said, I, I started this kind of uh, investigation looking more at the direct relationship of language, of specific words or having words to describe weather, uh, and in, in return, found more interesting things that it's even more basic than that. It, even in the concepts of language development, that it was really born out of, um, some aspects of it are born out of the weather in which the region where the, the language was originated. So, you know, kind of interesting when you think about it. And while I didn't investigate this, the, the kind of the interesting tidbit, I, the additional piece I found in this 
was a, a study that's been, I, I would say it's a little newer, so you don't, you know, I wouldn't put too much credibility in it. Maybe, again, I'll put the link in there, and you can decide if this one's true or not, that has to do with the language we use to describe weather and futuristic weather even and the prosperity of the region. Now, one could ask, is this a result of a region not doing well, or is it the language has always been such that the people naturally developed a prosperity? And this is the part where I think it gets a little tricky, um, and, it, and it maybe isn't as easy to make the relationship. But the finding was simply this. So think of two ways of describing uh, weather, one being in present tense. So um, it is likely to rain this weekend is being, you know, in the present tense versus um, there will be rain. There will likely be rain this weekend. So that's looking futuristically. And what the finding was is that if I'm using that present tense is I'm in a region that has more prosperity than if I'm using the futuristic will be such that, and, and, and here's what they were trying to draw to, is it, it was a broader descriptor of, think of it this way, someday we'll be better off, as opposed to thinking you're already better off, you know, the, that someday being now. Um, again, I, I found that one a little bit more of a stretch, and I'm not sure, you know, which is the chicken and which is the egg here, but... Uh, Look at the look at the video. There's a he's, person's actually even done a TED talk, and and I'll put um, again a link to the article in the show notes so that you can uh, take a look at it yourself and decide. So that's the first topic we've looked at at language and the weather. Again, I think we'll come back to this topic from time to time. Like I said, I, one of the things I wanted to look at was uh, some of the ways in which people um, in which weather terminology or phraseology influences other aspects of life. And, and maybe there's nothing to be found there. I mean, that's, you know, a lot of times when I start digging up these things, I either get sidetracked like I did a little bit this week, um, or I turn around and find that what I thought might be interesting is definitely not going to be the case. So we'll, we'll take that and, and play with it a little more sometime down the road. Now, for our next episode, as I, as I promised, we're going to dig a little bit into uh, the impact of weather on history and has weather actually influenced the course of history. Uh, specifically for the first one of those, we're going to look into uh, D-Day and explore that. And then um, we'll probably, um, you know, as I've, as I've discussed previously, we might jump back into the probabilities a little bit more, uh, you know, after you've had some time to absorb uh, the previous episode, and we'll talk about why I think uh, having probabilistic weather forecast is actually a good thing and uh, something that you should look for when you're evaluating weather forecast, uh, particularly after you get past the first or the second day. Now, the next video, we're going to cover uh, evaporative cooling, as I mentioned. And Early next month, um, I'm going to be going on a bit of a vacation, but I will put out an episode that's related to, and, and this is going to be a topic that we grow on as well in future episodes, but the changing weather enterprise. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term weather enterprise, it's one of those fancy things that we who uh, work in the field of meteorology, and you know, a lot of times you, you, know, you see some people that maybe you're a broadcast meteorologist or you know some people you know working in a national weather service office so you can imagine that but there's there's a lot more to it than that both in the public and the private sector um, but particularly some changes that are going on in the enterprise that are that are impacting the broadcast meteorology sector so um, it's it's a topic that's of particular interest to me and I, and I hope you'll find it enjoyable as well so Let's summarize a little bit. So since the last time we talked, um, you know, some of you may have seen me post about uh, crossing 500 downloads. And, and, you know, by many standards in this day and age, that, that may not be a lot. But um, I had no idea, like I said, where this thing was going to go. So the fact that we've reached 500 downloads of the first eight episodes, um, I'm very grateful for. 
And as of recording this, we're also only down to Antarctica. We've got to find somebody in Antarctica who we can trace that they downloaded the episode to Antarctica. Um, or they can either send me some sort of message that says they're there and they got it and listen to it. Um, that's the last continent we have to cover. And uh, lastly, uh, the Patreon. Um, I have kind of fully set this up now. And as I mentioned before, um, and we'll get into the RSVP here now, um, but before we, we summarize it that way, if you're finding value in the podcast and you want to give back some value monetarily, I've got the patron thing set up now where you can do as few as 10 cents an episode, but it also gives you a way to cap each month. So if you only want to give for two episodes and that's the max, that's fine. Um, the plan hasn't really changed. We're going to stay on probably four episodes a month and, and go from there. But um, if you want to give some value back, it'd be appreciated. But Realistically, as I've said, RSVP and those other things, the non-Patreon things are, are equally as important, if not more so in the early stages of the podcast, because the long-term surviving of this podcast, while, while I'll keep doing it because I love doing it and I'm really enjoying doing it, and now that we enter the third month, I, I'm starting to find a routine and a way to work it around my normal schedule. Um doing it for more people and growing the audience and getting ideas from a broader audience, a global audience, it's going to be important to keeping what we're doing fresh. And uh, I'm hoping that together that we can continue to grow the audience and find people um, who are surprised to learn that uh, there is something about the weather and that, they want to be a part of it too. So the first thing is rate, and 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 again, all these things. So take a take a minute after you finish listening to this episode. If 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 this is your first episode, you you get a pass. But if this is a uh, one of your uh, second or third listens or watches with the vidcast as well, take a minute and do just one of the following. Or if you have time to do more than one, that's great. So rate us if you if you pull this on iTunes or Pocket Cast, or wherever you get it from. If the source you get it from has a rating service, rate us. If you want to write a review, great. But the the ratings are what, and, and rate us high, of course. Um, the ratings are what drive discoverability. And with all things, that's the hardest part. The second way, share. Help somebody, teach them how to subscribe to a podcast. Or tell one one person you know, hey, have you listened to What Is It About the Weather? So share it. Three, validate. And like I said, this has been the part where you guys are doing great already, which is giving me feedback and giving me show ideas. And, and that's exactly what I want. As much as I have ideas, I want the show to be about what we all love about weather. And I'm always intrigued about what you know different angles people come from that don't spend their life in the weather enterprise or do, but they're intrigued by a different aspect of what, how weather impacts our lives. And, of course, the last part with Pledge, and I've already covered that with Patreon, so I'm not going to get into it. But let's cover the ways to get hold of me. First and foremost, if you go to the website, you can find all these things. So the links are there. So what is it about the weather.com? Also, if you want to send email feedback, I'm gonna, I, I still need to put the comment or connect form on the website, which I hope to do in the next couple of weeks. But what is it about the weather at gmail.com? So just if you remember nothing else, what is it about the weather.com? What is it about the weather at gmail.com? From there, from the website, you can get us via Twitter. Okay. Or if you want to send me show ideas uh, on Twitter, that's fine too. At Mark underscore Jelinek. That's J E L I N E K. You can get me on Instagram. Not really good for sharing show ideas, but you can share neat weather photos, as you guys know I've been doing as well. Uh, Facebook, LinkedIn as well, if you really want to do that. And I, and I also mentioned YouTube. Um, and this is this like iTunes. If, if, you've got a, if you've got a Gmail account, go into the YouTube. Go to the whatisitabouttheweather.com. Click on YouTube and just subscribe. Um, when we get to 100 subscribers, we can do a custom URL and it'll make it so much easier for everybody else to find us. And, and, you know, while you're there, watch a few videos. You'll, you'll also notice that one of the other things I'm doing, and it's, and it's hard to do because um, I don't have a lot of, you know, hours in the day for production time and that sort of thing because I, I work full time. But if 
if I come across an interesting weather event and I've got a few moments to post a video, I'm doing that on YouTube because it's just an easy platform to get it up and load it on. And you'll see I'm doing some things called what is it about the weather shorts. And so those are just little things that I might, tidbits that I might think about related to the weather or weather events that I come across that I think you might be interested in. So again, thank you for all your support thus far. Uh, let's continue to use the RSVP model and grow what is it about the weather going forward now that we've got uh, a couple months under the belt and um, hopefully you're enjoying it. Uh, it's something that I want to keep doing and expand to a much broader audience. So until next time, until next time, have good, exciting, but as always, safe weather.